Okay, I think we're about to begin. Good evening and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird and I am the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I wanna thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will take place on Thursday, November 9th in the Graduate Center's Siegel Theater and online via Zoom. This will be a mixed uh, event in person, but also on Zoom. This 6.30 p.m. event will feature Professor Frank Costigliola chatting with me about his very stimulating new biography of George Kennan. But tonight, I'm delighted to introduce our very own Leon Levy fellow, Rachel Swarns, who will be talking about her new book, The 272, The Families Who Were Enslaved and Sold to Build the American Catholic Church. She will be in conversation with Nicholas Lehman. Rachel Swarns is a journalism professor at New York University and a contributing writer for the New York Times, where she served as a reporter and correspondent for 22 years. She is the author of American Tapestry, the story of the black, white, and multiracial ancestors of Michelle Obama, and a co-author of Unseen, unpublished Black History from the New York Times Photo Archives. Her work has been recognized and supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Ford Foundation, and Biographies International Organization and the McDowell Artist Residency Program. In 2023, she was elected to the Society of American Historians. Nicholas Lehman is both Dean Emeritus of the Columbia School of Journalism and a staff writer for The New Yorker. His books include Transaction Man, The Rise of the Deal, and The Decline of the American Dream, 2019. Redemption, The Last Battle of the Civil War, published in 2006. The Big Test, The Secret History of the American Meritocracy in 1999, which also helped to lead a major reform of the SAT. And The Promised Land, The Great Black Migration and How It Changed America, published in 1991. He is a member of the New York Institute for the Humanities, and he was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2010. Please look for all these books at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Rachel and Nicholas will be in conversation now for about 45 minutes, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions, and Nick will be sure to get to as many as he can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to Nicholas Lehman. Thank you. Okay, thanks Kai and uh, welcome everybody. Um, so, there's a lot to talk about here, but I just want to start by kind of, and let me just show everybody, this is the book that we're talking about. Um, and this is Rachel's previous book, which is also great. Um, so I just want to lay out what the book is about. So let's just start with, um, you know, in journalism, uh, supposedly people talk about, uh, you know, man bites dog stories. Um, this is a story of a bunch of uh, devout Catholic priests enslaving people and then selling them down the river. Uh, so how did that happen? Um, you know, the story came to me when I was um, a reporter um, at the New York Times still, and a colleague of mine got an email from a Georgetown alum saying, um, hey, you know, there's a great story about an 1838 slave sale that benefited Georgetown. And um, she was interested, but a little doubtful because, you know, was a 19th century slave sale even a story? 
Um, but she remembered that um, someone on the staff might know. She, know. she remembered my book about Michelle Obama's um, enslaved ancestors. And um, she sent it to me. And, um, you know, I knew uh, right away um, that it was a story. Um, my first book allowed me to explore how slavery shaped American families. I thought this would allow me to examine how slavery had fueled the growth um, of a contemporary institution. And, um, and I was really struck by it because, um, you know, priests, enslaved people, priests bought and sold people. Um, you know, I consider myself a reasonably educated person. Um, I happen to be black and Catholic too, and I, I knew none of this. And so, you know, I wanted to know more um, about the priests and about the families. And I started writing articles and that and that led to this book. So how did it happen that priests enslaved people? Let's let's go to the sort of the context before we get to the story. Yeah. So, um, you know, it it's it's the story of America in many ways, of course. Right. The Jesuit priests arrive um, in the British colonies um, in Maryland um, in the 1600s. Um, Maryland established in part as a refuge for Catholics fleeing persecution. And um, as the um, economy shifts from one that um, relies on indentured servants to one that relies on slave labor, um, they transition with it. And the um, first documented record of Jesuit slaveholding is 1717. And by the time um, there is this slave sale, 1838, of 272 people, they are among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. Outside of the U.S., uh, was the Catholic Church also implicated in slavery in other places? Yes. And in fact, um, you know, Catholic slaveholding in Latin America was far um, more widespread, actually. Um, many, you know, larger numbers of people were enslaved there. It's always a challenge when you're writing history, and part particularly this history in a way, to, um, you know, the, 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 there's this bedeviling question of why didn't people then see what's so obvious to us now. Um, what's the level of consciousness that the church had about slavery morally? Right, um, and it's a question, of course, that um, I ask myself often as I embarked on this, you know, how did they rationalize this? How did they justify this? Um, you know, in many ways, of course, it's, it's not surprising. Um, slavery was legal. Um, Rome, in fact, while um, condemning um, uh, the coming to condemn the enslavement of indigenous people in the Americas, um, was silent for a very long time about the buying and selling of black people. Um, it's it's a very um, but it's complicated because um, Catholic priests didn't, um, as some white people um, did, view Black people as like animals or brutes. They viewed them as human beings with souls and souls that needed tending and souls that they had an obligation to tend and to nurture. So um, they felt that obligation at the same time that they felt that it was okay to buy and sell people. But all along the way, um, there were people, there were priests who raised questions, who raised concerns, who even protested, um, you know, the sales. Um, and so um, I always think that that's an important thing, too, because if you're writing about slavery, people often say, don't bring the 21st century, your moral judgments to this issue. Um, but these priests um, were wrestling in real time with some of these questions. Um, the priests who um, raised concerns and, and, and protested were lonely voices for sure, but, but they were there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's bring Georgetown University into the story. Yeah. Now let's so, have that connection. Got yeah, made. so as I mentioned, these priests, um, you know, they arrive in the British colonies. Um, they are... Um, uh, relying increasingly on um, slave sales and slave labor. And they use, um, they rely on that to build, in effect, 
the underpinnings of the American Catholic Church. So priests who rely on slave labor and slave sales established the first Catholic archdiocese, the first Catholic cathedral, um, the first Catholic institution of higher learning, Georgetown. Um, Priests who operated um, a plantation and sold people established the first Catholic cemetery. And Georgetown um, becomes the prize mission project um, of, of the, the Jesuits. Um, and, and money um, and produce from these plantations support um, Georgetown. And in the 1830s, when times were hard and Georgetown and the Jesuits were indebted, and a vision of a different kind of Catholic church um, emerged. Um, and when they needed money to deal with those things, um, they decided to do what a lot of people did, which is sell off their assets, which at the time happened to be human property, 272 men, women, and children to save Georgetown and to, um, you know, to build the vision that they had. So what happened let's talk about now about the 272 and and kind of who were they to whom were they sold what happened to them yeah so um you know there were many families um scores of families um who were enslaved by the jesuits um and many of these families were in um in Maryland for generations. These plantations were in Southern um, Maryland. And I focus on one family. Um, it is the Mahoney family and their experience parallels the emergence um, of the Catholic church and the Catholic church's reliance on slavery in the British colonies and then in the early um, United States. And I trace from the matriarch, um, who is a Black woman by the name of Anne Joyce, who arrives as an indentured servant um, and um, comes at a time, that transition time, um, where um, people are relying increasingly on slavery. Her contract is burned. She's forced into slavery. And um, that story um, that she has, which is all she has left, is one that she passes on um, to her children and grandchildren um, that we sh our, our liberty was stolen, we should be free people. Um, and I, I tell the story as the generations um, go on. Some of her descendants resist, some file lawsuits against um, the, the Jesuits to try um, and win their freedom. Um, some kill an overseer and are executed. Others try to navigate their way in, in within um, the system. Um, Harry Mahoney um, in the War of 1812 saves the church's wealth um, on the plantation that he was on. And for his courage and loyalty is, is promised that neither he nor his children will ever be sold. And that promise is broken in 1838 um, with the mass sale. So I want to return to that in a minute, but let's just sort of get the story of the 272 logistically in place. Mm -hmm. um, to whom are they sold? And then what happened after they were sold? What happened to them? Right. So um, there's a debate about the sale. Rome finally approves it um, with conditions. Um, they wanted um, the enslaved to be able to continue to practice their faith. And Rome insisted also that families should not be separated. Mm -hmm. So Louisiana was what they settled on. Um, large plantations where they thought they could find a buyer who could buy a lot of people. Um, Catholic, um, so that people could um, potentially con continue um, with the faith. And um, they ended up with two big buyers, um, a doctor um, and a congressman. Um, and they end up, um, a large group end up, they go in multiple in multiple shipments multiple times, um, but um, a large number of them end up in um, Ascension Parish um, and in Iberville Parish um, on plantations there. I should tell the audience the reason I've been given this assignment is that my own family comes from Ascension Parish. Um, 
obviously not enslaved, but I've, I've spent a lot of quality time in Ascension Parish. So um, I know the area. So let's talk about Ascension Parish a little bit. Um, it, it's, well, first of all, you know, just describe, if you would, the physically the journey from Maryland to Louisiana. Yeah. And then what they found in Louisiana and how, how were the plantations different um, in Louisiana from what they'd known? Right. So in the Chesapeake, um, in these plantations in, in Southern Maryland, it was wheat and tobacco and corn primarily. Um, and there was great, great, great fear about um, being sold um, to the Deep South. Um, the priests talked about the fear that the enslaved people had. They talked too about, um, you know, the differences um, that they, as they understood it. And the differences being that the crops um, we're talking about were um, cotton and sugarcane and um, the conditions um, involved in um, growing, planting, harvesting um, those crops were, um, you know, brutal. Um, and people knew that. Um, and so, um, you know, they are on the docks um, in November of 1838, the family that I follow, um, and on a ship um, called the Catherine Jackson that carries them to New Orleans. Um, and from New Orleans, they um, typically um, were taking boats up the river um, to, to Baton Rouge and, um, and up further even, and, and they ended up, as I mentioned, like in the Donaldsonville um, Ascension Parish um, area. These ships were, um, you know, this is the domestic slave trade that we, we offer. We know a little more, I think, as Americans about the, you know, the transatlantic slave trade than we do about the domestic. And we should say to fill in, the transatlantic slave trade had been banned and that enhanced the domestic slave trade, obviously. Right, because the demand for labor for um, these um, vast plantations um, was enormous. Um, and so um, these folks ended up um, first on cotton plantations um, and then on sugarcane plantations. High death right. rates, um, you know, it's a, a, a very different world. Yeah, this was... Um... I, I like to say to people, this was sort of like the 1830s equivalent of Silicon Valley or something. If you said to yourself, where can I go in America where people are making the biggest fortunes really quickly? It would be Louisiana sugar country. That's right. In those days. That's right. And so the congressman had, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a manor house where, you know, people described, you know, all of the dignitaries that came through the champagne being poured, all of that, um, at the same time, um, as you know, these folks are, you know, torn from everyone and everything that they knew, and, and trying and desperately fearful that, you know, they may lose each other again, in, you know, subsequent sales. So I want to talk a little bit, since this is the, the you know, Levy Center for Biography, about your work as a biographer. Um, the challenge here is that um, the people you're writing about, or many of the people you're writing about, didn't leave, you know, conventional historical records, and often they didn't know how to read or write. Um, so how do you find them? How do you go about learning their life stories and getting a sense of them? Right. So, um, and and our viewers may know that um, enslaved people by law and by practice were barred from um, being able to learn to read or write. And so a lot of the, you know, materials that um, biographers and um, historians would rely on, you know, to write full lives of people are absent letters, journals. Um, I think one letter has been um, uncovered so far of uh, a person who was enslaved by the Jesuits. So um, sometimes people say, okay, 272 people were sold. How did you settle on the Mahoney family? And the truth is I, there are scores of families, scores of fascinating stories, but I had to go where the records were. And really, you're piecing together strands. So for um, the Mahoney family, um, one of the most important sets of records was this lawsuit. I mentioned that they filed a lawsuit against the priests. 
Um, that lawsuit, um, it, it's, it exists, it's in the archives. Um, there are depositions that um, exist that describe um, that matriarch, Anne Joyce, her, her descendants talking about what happened to her. White people talk who, who heard stories about her or even knew her as a child um, talking about her. Um, and that was a, a, a real gift because that allowed me to cover a huge span of time from the late 1600s to the late 1700s when these suits um, were filed. Um, really, really important. And then, of course, you know, you're following, um, you know, property records because, you know, you're talking about human beings, but they were considered property. So you're looking at tax records, you're looking at mortgages, um, you're looking at plantation records, um, and, um, you know, kind of piecing together strands here and there. There, um, I mentioned Harry Mahoney, who um, won this pledge from the Jesuits in the War of 1812. He has two daughters who I describe. One of them remains in Maryland and lives a long time. And so um, the priests, um, she dies in about 1909, the priests, 20th century priests know her and write about her and write about this story that she told them about Anne Joyce and this, this history. Um, and then, of course, there were the records on on the other side in Louisiana, you know, the parish, the courthouse records, again, tax records, um, lots of records in the Jesuit archives. Um, but again, letters from the priests, again, it's it's really, um, they're not, they're writing about people tangentially, um, they're sacramental records too, so you're really weaving together these strands of um, information. I think you know uh, my colleague uh, Howard French. Um, so, and maybe you know his brother James has recently become the board chair of Montpelier Plantation, oh. um, which was James Madison's mm -hmm. slaveholding plantation. Um, so, I was talking to him about this and 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 saying, how do you put together? You know, because he's doing all these memory projects, and um, he said. Well, you don't always have to go forward from the records in the past. You can go backward from people in the present because stories get handed down from generation to generation. So is is that part of how you do your research? That's absolutely right. Um, and, and part of, I think, as a journalist, you know, I'm not a historian, as a journalist, um, really what um, interests me um, is kind of this the past, but how we live with it now. So I, in, in looking for um, a family to focus on, I was interested in two primary things, a family that was torn apart in this sale, um, and then a family where, you know, there are descendants on the other side in our day um, who are wrestling and grappling um, with this history too. And, um, Harry Mahoney's daughter, Louisa, who stayed um, in Maryland, that family um, remains um, entangled with the Jesuits. Um, they continue to work for the Jesuits well into the 20th century. And so that line of the family actually knew um, about um, Anne Joyce and, and, and the story. That, that story followed through. Um, the Louisiana side, though, um, did not. Um, and, and the Maryland side, no one had, um, uh, it, none of the contemporary people had any um, awareness of the sale or, or Georgetown being connected in any way. Do you ever feel tempted when you're doing this to sort of fill in or have suppositional passages or any of that, what someone must have been thinking or might have been thinking? So, you know, there's... Um, Right now, there are, um, this is something of a, a debate, you know, among folks who do this kind of work. I mean, there are um, people who argue that the archive, in effect, um, because, um, you know, not only are people barred from learning to read or write, but, you know, uh, people were marginalized, and so newspapers didn't write about them, that the archive, in effect, silences people, right? And so if that is indeed the case, then what shouldn't shouldn't we have some license um, to envision and and to restore in that way? Um, and I I hear that I hear that I understand the sentiment, um, but I'm too much of a journalist um, to do that. So 
Um, I so I can't imagine or, or 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 recreate stuff that I don't know. I do though say, and I I think you know as as the um, put myself in it in the sense of um, you know we don't know. I you know did she did she weep? Did she? We don't know. And so, but I ask those kinds of questions in. Um, in the book, because um, I want to know, and I think the reader wants to know, um, what I do um, to try and um, fill some of the absence, which there is a lot, there are many questions I don't know, and to bring voices into it is um, to share the stories of um, contemporaneous people, enslaved people, mm -hmm. similarly situated um, in, this, in, in Maryland or in Louisiana, whose narratives have survived, um, who talk about kind of what the conditions were like at a certain plantation or what it was like to be sold and torn apart from your family and to bring voices in that way. Did you find a difference in, in how you were able to do the research between the Michelle Obama's family book and this book? And if so, could you talk about that? So much more is digitized. <laughs> So much okay. more is available, stay home. right? Like right, right, right here, right now at my mm -hmm. at my laptop. I um, actually I mentioned that um, some of Anne Joyce's um, descendants um, were executed, and um, I actually found the record just by one day on a kind of whim, throwing into Google, um, you know, the overseer's name um, and um, you know something else, and boom up came um, a digitized record from the Maryland State Archives with the heading something like, you know, slaves hangings. And I mean, and a long list, including, um, you know, what happened to these descendants. So um, that's quite something. Um, on the other hand, um, there's so much that's still not digitized. So, you know, going to um, the archives or to the courthouses and looking at these vast, um, huge <laughs> books um, is really invaluable too. And actually there's something enormously powerful to me about that, about the kind of, um, you know, look at the physical um, presence of, of these records and the names and, and, and what you can see. Um, that's kind of really powerful to me. I don't know if people can see this. That that looks familiar, yes. right? That's what we're talking <laughs> right. about. And and sometimes in French, right? Yeah. Um, and also, I'm dealing with um, religious. You know, the 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 priests writing sometimes in Italian and in Latin and in French, and so and the handwriting. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, you know, in in um, in Ascension Parish, you probably ran across this. This is sort of very creepy, but in the New Deal. <laughs> America's liberal peak, the Work Projects Association was trying to, you know, find work for people to do. So one of the tasks was to go into the records and take the French records handwritten and type them and make a new record book. But they said, we're excluding cattle sales and slave sales from that project. So oh, all all of the property records are trans are, are typewritten in English, and the slave records are still in handwritten in French. I didn't know that they had transcribed. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> that's so why that's we it. were stuck with all of those. Records. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just you know we got a lot of ground to cover in limited times, but. Um, Let's try. Um, and, and I want to encourage people in the audience to send questions into Q&A. OK, so the Emancipation Proclamation comes down. Uh, so the people are no longer enslaved. Then what happens? So, um, yeah, it's a really um, interesting time um, in Louisiana. Um, for a time um, on one of the plantations, um, which has exchanged hands a couple of times now, um, the um, um, slave, the former slaveholder, um, you know, has people work, starts paying people, right, to work, and 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 people do that for a year or two, um, and then um, people move on. Um, a number of people move to um, New Orleans. Um, you know, the folks in Iberville Parish, there's a community that stays in, in that area for a long time. And Maringouin, Louisiana has many descendants who are still there. 
um, in um, in Maryland, um, they um, stay, you know, um, and as I mentioned, um, continue working um, many uh, members of the Mahoney family um, for um, for a long time, for decades. One of the things that's particularly interesting is um, the decision people made about, you know, their faith, you know, whether to stay or not uh, with a church that had betrayed them. And um, interestingly, many people stayed. And that's interesting because, you know, thousands of Black people left the Catholic Church, which, you know, after emancipation um, discriminated um, within the church, you know, with segregated seating, um, you know, whites getting communion first, segregated festivities and stuff like that. But um, a lot of these family members stay. And in fact, the sacramental records end up being an important, um, you know, guide um, to folks who are studying these families. And not only do they stay, um, but some become lay leaders and some become religious leaders as they try to kind of, you know, prod the, sh the church to be more reflective of and responsive to um, Black people. Have, have you wrestled with leaving the church? You know, it's it's an interesting question. Um, and, um, you know, certainly while I was um, working on this, it was something that I thought about. Again, I, I had no idea. It was not history that I knew. And I am, you know, I'm a practicing Catholic, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, reading these records, I'm going to mass, I'm, I'm going to confession. Um, I, I think that um, actually, uh, for me, um, the story of these families is actually, and their resilience is actually, you know, pretty inspiring to me. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm still here. I also like to say to when people ask me, well, would you stay or go? Where would I go? Because of course, this is a story of the Catholic Church, but it's a story of America. Even the Quakers enslaved people until they didn't. So um, there are not a lot of um, uh, churches that, that, that don't have a, a history here. So let's go more toward the present now. Um, this is an odd situation where the story that you initially did in the New York Times then becomes a big deal in a whole bunch of ways, including for Georgetown institutionally. So you're in charge of essentially covering the reaction to your own story. Um, so I'm curious both uh, uh, for some account of, of what Georgetown University has done with this information and with what it's like to report on, in a sense, your own story in that way. So um, Georgetown and the Jesuits have both um, tried to, um, you know, address this history in in in, in our time. Um, both institutions have apologized um, for their participation in um, the enslavement and the sales of of black people. Georgetown um, uh, established preference and admissions um, for descendants um, and became the first, one of the first major institutions, um, universities to do that, you know, legacy status in effect um, for descendants. Um, they also um, have established what they described as a reconciliation fund. They're raising $400,000 a year um, toward projects that benefit um, descendants. Um, the Jesuits um, have partnered with a group of descendants to establish a foundation and have pledged to raise $100 million um, toward racial reconciliation projects and projects that benefit descendants. It's the largest effort um, by the Roman Catholic Church to address its history of um, its participation in the American slave trade um, in the United States. It has been, um, fundraising though has been kind of, you know, not moving as quickly as they had hoped. Um, so all of this is kind of, um, you know, happening, evolving as we speak. Um, and as for, you know, watching this unfold, um, it ha it has been really pretty remarkable. Like, you know, write a story, um, you never know. Uh, it felt at the time when I was working on it, when um, that it felt urgent to me. Um, it felt really urgent. It felt like it spoke to something really important about kind of who we are now and how we got here. Um, but I don't think I ever imagined that I would see all of this. 
Three years ago, after the murder of George Floyd, there was a lot of conversation about how the U.S. was having a racial reckoning. And, you know, you could say that, that your book is part of that. I don't know if you'd be comfortable with that or not. But I, I want to ask the larger question. Do you think we are having a racial reckoning? You know, um, we are in um, a very um, complicated place. Um, we have... Um, a situation where history has become a battleground um, in a lot of ways. So you have, on the one hand, um, many institutions, uh, universities, there are more than 90 universities right now um, looking at their histories um, in slavery and trying to grapple with that. Harvard is looking at it. Princeton has looked at it. Um, there are municipalities um, around the country that are looking at their, the history of slavery and Jim Crow, Evanston, Illinois, the state of California, at the same time um, that there are these incredible headwinds where there are politicians trying to prevent the teaching of this, trying to ban books about this. There is this kind of... Um, uh, these these parallel forces happening, you know, at the same time. So, uh, which is not uncommon um, in our history. So you you do have these efforts to reckon with it, and you have these efforts um, to try to prevent us from reckoning um, with it. Um, so it's it's complicated, and it makes me feel that the work is even uh, more urgent than I had thought it was. <laughs> How does knowing the history help us in the present? I think what do it's do with it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's essential. I think there are, you know, I think um for a lot of people, if you talk about um slavery, um, you know, it's up stop right there, you know, nothing to do with me a long time ago, you know, just one guy selling another and they're all dead. Um, I feel like, you know, understanding that. Um, slavery fueled the growth of so many of our contemporary um, institutions that um, these that are, you know this is a legacy that lives with us now um, is 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 really important um, and I think you know if you think about um, wealth in this country and inequities and in wealth um, um, in this country um, I think it helps you to understand a little bit um, of where that is but I think. Um, you know, it's it's just really, really important to know kind of how foundational it was. And for like, you know, the Catholic Church, um, you know, which is obviously what I focus on in this book, you know, most of us think about the Catholic Church as a Northern Church, as an immigrant church. Um, you know, enslaved people had been largely left out of the origin story that is traditionally told about the Catholic Church. And I think understanding that enslaved people were at the center of how, you know, the church emerged and grew um, in this country is, is really important. Um, something that I've experienced a lot over the years, I'm sure you have too, of, you know, you'll be doing these kinds of historical projects, interviewing older Black people, and you'll say, what were you told about what slavery was like? You often get the answer, nothing. That's because right. my my grandma said, "Don't ask me about that. That's over. We're That's shutting right. the door." So you've heard that too. And it's and it's such a you're, it's such a good point because you know like we um, some of the amnesia um, that we have as Americans is a um, you know a whitewashing of you know like like you know white people don't want to talk about it, but it is also just very very true that black people too have you know this is painful, difficult history. And um, it feels akin um, to me, you know, I spent I, I like, it's, it's um, you know, the result of a trauma, deep, deep, deep trauma. Um, I spent time in South Africa and I, you know, you could, you know, hear similar things about kind of not wanting to be there. And, and sometimes people tell me, um, children, grandchildren of Holocaust survivors talk about also that kind of, and in a way, you know, it's hard, I, even in my own family, you know, my father was uh, born in the segregated South, um, the uh, grandson of, um, great grandson of slaves, and uh, no, nothing, nothing. I think it was a way of, you know, just trying to move forward. 
Um, but so much is lost in that. So when you spend time with descendants now, what can you say about the process of kind of uncovering and taking on board that history? How does that work for people? I think there are generational dif differences for sure. So I think, um, you know, folks, um, you know, uh, the younger generation are, um, it's easier um, and they are, they really want to grapple with it. I was talking to a descendant um, who was first contacted, the first contact from a genealogist um, was to her great aunt. And the great aunt wanted nothing to do with it. But her son said, wait, wait, we're going to call that person back. <laughs> I want to know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do see that kind of generational thing. And the other thing that's perhaps a bit counterintuitive is that, you know, people ask, OK, how do descendants respond? You know, I say people weep, people rage, um, but there is something you know, for many of us, because of the things we were talking about, you know, no letters, um, Black people, enslaved people often appear only by first name right. um, in, in the records. Finding your ancestors is so difficult. Um, and so for many people, even though it is not what they would ever have asked for, it is a gift to have this information. It is a gift to be able to trace your ancestors back and to know the names and know something of their experiences. So it is this kind of mixed bag for people. I should Let's just take a minute and you could spend two hours on this, I know. <laughs> but just if there are descendants in the audience, where would you recommend if you're sort of curious and you don't know where to start, to look for your history. Yeah, um, Georgetown has put together, um, I know you can just punch it into Google, the Georgetown Slavery Archive. And they have digitized um, scores of, of records, um, you know, and they try to go back to the earliest records available um, up to, um, you know, some of the news articles and, um, and things that have appeared in, you know, the past seven years. And it's a great resource. You can um, see it all online. You can download um, the records. And um, you know, one of the things that's been really powerful to see in terms of the descendant community, when I wrote my first story, um, only a handful of descendants had been identified. Now there are more than 6,000 and they have been in the business of bringing those families that were torn apart Maryland, Louisiana, back together um, with reunions in Louisiana and in um, Maryland, Zoom calls, phone calls, outings. Um, it's it's really something to see. And there's also there's a beautiful uh, monument that's been made in in Donaldsonville in an old church to the 272, um, which if you're ever in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen it. I'd love to see it. What if you're not a descendant what do you want to see people do with this old story and this kind of information i guess um you know i i i i like to say that you know we should sometimes i think we assume um that history because it comes in books and you know it's it's just kind of there you are that that that's the whole thing and i i just i guess i i would like people to think um about, um, you know, who's telling the story, you know, um, whose voices are you hearing? Whose voices aren't you hearing? And why aren't you hearing that? And, you know, as a journalist, it's a very kind of, you know, th this is kind of what we do, right? If someone is uh, presenting you with their financial documents, you ask those questions. But I think we need to ask those questions about our history. Um, um, and I think, um, you know, I think that would be a good start to me. And then what do you do once you know you're the history? I mean, if you are a descendant, it's partly to kind of, quote, know who you are. If you're not a descendant and you do the, you know, go to the effort of acquainting yourself with what really happened, what you should you do right now? I mean, that's a hard question. So, you know, I'm not a so I'm a journalist. I'm not a policy person. I'm not someone who um, argues will 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 tell you get on the phone and call your congressman and reparations now. That's that's kind of not the role that I I I yeah. feel that I play. But I think that um, you know, educating yourself, um, getting familiar with this history, 
um, feels to me really important in terms of understanding kind of how we got to where we are now. Um, and what you do with that, um, I think will be something that you will decide. Um, but I think, you know, for me as someone who um, does the research and tells the story, it feels like it's really important for all of us as Americans to understand this history. Okay, now I'm going to uh, open up the Q&A box and ask uh, questions that people have thrown in. So we have about 15 more minutes to go, 15 or 20 minutes. So um, feel free to lob in more questions. And, you know, if, if I get through all of them, I'll ask more questions of my own. Um, okay, so first question. First two questions are by the same person, Joseph Mendez. So I'll ask them together. One, did any church leaders in the 18th and 19th century oppose slavery? Number two, as Northern Protestant churches publicly opposed slavery from the 1830s on, did any Catholic churches join them in opposition? Really excellent question. So I think I mentioned that there were voices, lonely voices um, within the church that um, raise questions and concerns. Within um, the story that I tell, for instance, there's a, a priest by the name of Father Joseph Carberry who um, is vehemently opposed to the sale. Um, he has people in his community praying that it won't happen white and black. He goes to Georgetown to, um, a, you know, to uh, raise his voice against it. And, and when that doesn't work either, he encourages people to run, actually. Um, and, and then in the 1860s, um, there are some... Um, in leadership. Um, there's a bishop in Ohio, for instance, who actually, you know, has a, a parish newspaper and, and actually talks about, you know, how these contradictions with, you know, the Declaration of Independence and and what is going on in this country. And and he calls for emancipation. Um, he is roundly um, criticized and <laughs> condemned by um you know, Catholic press and his his colleagues, but you know, that that happens. Timothy O'Connor asks a sort of logistical question that I can't really answer, but I'll just read it. Will this webinar be recorded and made available and accessible afterwards? I know it's being I recorded. I think they are. I think they're pretty should. sure it's getting it. So if you just go on the Levy Center website, I think you would get the answer there. Uh, here's a question from an anonymous attendee. Did Rachel have any uncanny experiences in the process of researching this book, serendipitous encounters or discoveries? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are all kinds of discoveries um, all along the way. And then discoveries, of course, that you wish would happen that don't happen <laughs> along the way. Um, one of the things that was um, surprising and, and most um, helpful was that um, maybe a year or two into my research, uh, more records um, were uncovered um, at Georgetown um, where the Jesuit archives are held. These were records that hadn't been cataloged before and they were important records because they were financial um, ledgers mostly. Um, and there had been some thinking that um, because of the financial problems that the two big buyers had, that Georgetown and the Jesuits um, didn't get much money after 1838, that they got the down payment that was made, but not much money after that. And these records showed that, um, you know, these people were bought, in effect, on an installment plan, right. um, that the money from these buyers and also from small buyers in Maryland who bought one or two people trickled in year after year after year. And so that was that was something um, that was important and a surprise. Next question from Holly Kay. Were there any Jewish slaveholders who have been identified? Oh, so if you want me to take that one? I will. So well, so you can, and I, I'll, I'll just say that that's not part of this story. But Michelle Obama's um, had ancestors who were enslaved in South Carolina by Jewish slaveholders, and and maybe you can speak a little more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the famous one was Judah P. Benjamin, who was the uh, Secretary of the Treasury in the Confederacy, and and was a slaveholder, a pretty major slaveholder. Um, you know, in Ascension Parish and neighboring St. James Parish, um, there were two 
of Jewish businessmen, one of whom was I'm descended from, and the other was a man named Leon Gottschall, who saw emancipation as an opportunity and went and bought plantations right after the Civil War and ran plantations um, you know, in the late 19th century, sugarcane plantations. Um, now, and, and uh, one of Leon Gottschall's descendants, a man named Peter Wolf, just wrote a book about his family. So you can, you can read that. Um, it should be said that I don't find any sense of, uh, well, we waited because we have this deep moral obligation to slavery. I think they just thought this is a business opportunity to, to buy plantations for pennies on the dollar. And second, you know, they were operating these plantations the, the for complicated reasons, um, cotton plantations were mostly on the sharecropper system and sugar plantations were mostly on a wage system with pathetically low wages. So, um, you know, if you're operating in the Jim Crow system, massive, you know, white supremacy atmosphere. Uh, I don't think you're in, you know, you're, you're profiting from America's racial ordering. Uh, just and just because you weren't a plantation slave owner doesn't isn't isn't entirely exculpatory. So that's the way I would put it is that um, there's mythology, you know, that sort of exaggerates how many Jewish plantation slave owners there were, but but there were some definitely. Um, okay, next question is from Crystal Frederick Mitchell Tree. Good evening. Thank you for taking time to write such a wonderful book and having this discussion this evening. I'm a fifth generation descendant of Alexius Yorkshire. You know the name? Uh, Ms. Swarns, in your book, you touch on how the slave owners and Jesuits felt that black slaves were stronger and more robust than Central American slaves. Do you feel that this type of rhetoric has shaped some of the internal racial disparities among people of color, such as colorism, stereotypes, etc.? Well, you know, I mean, there was certainly, um, they, they were certainly making distinctions about people of color, right? They, particularly when, um, you know, Rome was looking at um, the enslavement of indigenous people and that there was all this rhetoric about, um, you know, Africans were, you know, stronger um, and more uh, brutish um, and, um, the indigenous people in um, the Americas were um, more, um, you know, we were just not cut out for this kind of heavy labor. And, 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 you know, and so there were those distinctions made. And in fact, you know, the um, Rome, you know, condemned, um, ultimately, the enslavement of indigenous people. Um, in terms of um, colorism, I'm not sure that there were um, you know, there were obviously there there were these kind of disparities that extend beyond you know Catholic slaveholding in terms of um, you know field labor and house labor um, and um, favoring of sometimes of um, the slaveholders' own children, right? Um, right. Mixed race children. So that is that is certainly. Um, but I don't know that that was a particular kind of thing in terms of um, colorism with. Um, with the, the priests who were slaveholders. Yeah, I mean, if you wanna say something really harsh about colorism, I mean, where it comes from often is uh, relationships that we now don't hesitate to call rape. Um, and the fact that being the offspring of such a relationship makes you better treated and treated as superior and maybe even feel superior is says a lot about um, the totality of race ordering in that society. That's right, and and some you know some you know enslavers um, you know educated um, yeah. um, their children or um, treated them better or um maybe they had a trade maybe they had some land um i think if you were to look i think there's some interesting statistics about you know the first um you know reconstruction politicians and the 
you know, yeah. the number of mixed race um, men who were in that first generation of political leadership. And it was a pretty high percentage, I think. Um, okay, now on to the next question from Anna O'Gara. Jesuits have a long history of ownership of enslaved people, in addition to the sale of the Georgetown 272 in pre-colonial Illinois. Uh, the order founded several mission churches and kept and, and sold enslaved people. St. Louis University, sponsored by the order, also profited from the work and sale of slaves. This isn't really a question, but you might want to comment on it. Right, I, and that's absolutely right. And it's also important to know that it's not just the Jesuits. So it's uh, the Jesuits enslaved people you know, in various parts of the United States, I focus on kind of the emergence of the early Catholic Church in Maryland, but um, those those folks actually, there were, you know, there are very close ties between St. Louis and Maryland. Some, uh, when they were setting up those, um, those schools, they brought enslaved people from Maryland out there. Also other orders enslaved people, the nuns, the, the sisters um, enslaved people. Um, so it is certainly, um, bigger than Maryland, bigger than Georgetown, um, and, you know, and not just the Jesuits. Absolutely right. Um, Angela Dickey asks, what is your advice to descendants of enslavers in terms of our responsibility to descendants of enslaved? Mm -hmm. You know, one thing I think, um, and I've heard descendants talk about this, um, you know, there's, there's a group called Coming to the Table, um, it's a, a group where um, descendants of the enslaved and descendants of enslavers um, try to meet and reconcile. And one of the things that's particularly important um, to some people is records. Um, you know, there are many families that have, um, you know, records um, uh, of from this time that have names um, and and actually people have reached out to me saying, hey, you know, I, I actually have some of those records, like, but you know, it's first names, what do I do with it? You know, like, I, I would love someone to know about it. Um, you know, reaching out, if you do, you know, making those records available, um, reaching out to your historical society or your local library or seeing if there's a way um, to, to get those records out there, that might be one thing. And, and then again, and if you're interested in trying to explore this, um, more, this organization coming to the table, you can look it up, um, on, on Google and, and find out kind of how, at least in this group, descendants of the enslaved and descendants of enslavers are trying to, um, grapple with this history together. This is from Robin Pointer. Now we're getting a big rush of uh, questions at the last minute, so I'm not going to have time to pose <laughs> them all, just to warn everybody, because we only have a few minutes left. But she asks, thank you very much for the opportunity to learn about your book and your research process. Completely hypothetical in this case, but how would you have handled the story if Georgetown had resisted? I'm thinking of institutions that conceal information. Yeah. So um, I have to say that, um, you know, uh, I think that even, even now when there is more um, grappling with this history, um, you know, a lot of people are not excited to receive a phone call from the New York Times about looking into your roots in slavery. There are still concerns about that. And the, you know, the story that I told about you, I told you about the records that um, appeared um, in, in, in the, the archives, um, you know, I found out about those because someone contacted me and said, there are records that they don't want you to know about, and you need to know about these. Now, I don't know whether that person was right or not, or whether Georgetown would have told me or not, um, but those were important records, as I've said. And I think that the reality is that um, we can't assume um, that institutions um, will be um, forthcoming. In this in this instance, um, Georgetown, even before I wrote my first article, had decided that they wanted to grapple with this. Um, that they they put together a working group of a faculty to kind of look into their history to try and figure out ways to address it. Um, but I think that, you know, there are a lot of institutions that are not doing that. And that certainly makes the work harder, um, but not less urgent, I would say. 
Yeah, something about that that I'd like to say that also pertains to the previous question. You know, there's this whole conversation about so-called cancel culture and so on. And a lot of white people talking to other white people will say, you know, you can't talk about your own family connection to the enslavement because then you'll be canceled, you know. And I would argue almost exactly the opposite. It's 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 way better to acknowledge and try to grapple with than to say, well, I'm not talking about that because, you know, then I'll be canceled. You won't be canceled. You'll be often welcomed into a conversation that can be difficult at times, but very useful and necessary. Right. I think that, you know, um, among um, these um, descendants and among descendants um, uh, that I've come across in general, um, I think, I, I, I think I think people want um, you know this kind of grappling. People want people to address it and and to wrestle with it. Um, so um, yeah, so I think um, I understand um, you know we're in kind of difficult times, but I I, I do think that there's an openness to that. A um, couple more questions. Uh, what this is from Glenn Spear. What were the demographics of the Jesuits at the time in Georgetown? Irish, English Catholics from Maryland, other backgrounds? Were there different opinions on slavery related to those various backgrounds? Very interesting question. So, um, you know, Europeans, of course, um, Irish, um, the, the generation of um, priests who ended up, um, you know, organizing the sale were Irish Americans um, who were born here um, and educated here and educated in Rome. Um, but there were German priests, there were Italian priests. The dividing line um, often was among the American born um, versus the you know, European born. And the difference being that um, the Europeans um, often were older. And so they, they had more ties to kind of this, this history of how Catholicism had emerged and this paternalistic idea that you know these were our people these were our these were members of our family and that we are responsible for them they are part of the church and so it's a it's a kind of hard thing to wrap your mind around because of course they're enslaving these people but there was this sense that selling them for instance was like antithetical to what we should be doing enslaving them okay but selling them from where they their homes and from their people were okay whereas this you know, younger American born generation, um, you know, looked north and said, saw these waves of immigrants pouring into the cities and said, you know, the Catholic Church is not this rural thing. It's it's we need to position ourselves there and we need to establish colleges and, and be there. And to do that, we need money. And to do that, we need to sell these people. So those were some key differences. This is going to have to be the last question. Um, Timothy O'Connor asks, did any other Jesuit universities, churches, and institutions benefit from the proceeds of the 1838 sale? Mm -hmm. So Holy Cross um, College, College of the Holy Cross, and Loyola University, Maryland, benefit directly financial um, support from um, the Jesuits um, after the 1838 sale. Um, and both of those institutions have done um, some work looking at this history and grappling with this history. Loyola University of Maryland is doing that right now. Other Jesuit institutions, um, some of the other colleges um, didn't receive financial, um, direct financial support that we are aware of. Um, but, you know, the Maryland Jesuits trained faculty and provided leadership and supported them in that way. Okay, well, we're, we're out of time. So um, that has to be our last question. Thanks to the Leon Levy Center and to Shelby White for her generous support. Thank you, Rachel, for writing such a wonderful book, which I highly recommend to everybody. And um, good luck with with your, uh, I'm, I understand you're staying with this general cause and um, Godspeed. Thank you.
Yes, Nick, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, are, are, we're done, right? <laughs> I, I guess, yeah. The, yes, the yeah. audience is leaving and so on. So yes. I guess we are. So thanks for everybody. Well, thank you very much. That was a very thoughtful conversation. It was, yeah. it was terrific. Thank you. Yeah, and the crowd, you know, Hi, this is the uh, crowd the media center. Uh, you guys want me to end this for you guys? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Sorry, we're we a little you, backed everyone. up over here. Uh, we're very short staff over here. I'm so sorry, guys. I uh, just wanted to make sure you guys were done. We yeah, are. We fin we've, we're finished. Thank you. All, All righty. So I'm going to end it right now and have a good evening, everyone. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you all. all right. Bye -bye. Keep Bye -bye. in touch, guys. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.